You took away my family, so now I'm taking yours. Grandma's cat brutally killed by neighbor pit bulls, so she annihilates their family during Christmas. Misbehaving children traumatized by unforgiven Santa Claus. Little girl frightens teasing cousin with his most dreaded fear, a nasty rumor spreading girl gets called out during Christmas dinner, and a drunk homewrecker douche gets prison time during Christmas. Naturally, viewer discretion is advised. These revenge acts might be disturbing to snowflakes. Years ago, I used to work with a receptionist in a vet clinic named Margot. Margot was and still is a very sweet 65-year-old woman who had been at this practice since it was opened, some 40 years ago. She always had a smile, a joke, compliments and baked goods for your birthday. She never had an unkind word to say about anyone. She was seriously one of the coolest people I had ever worked with and she basically knew everyone, from our regular clients to our mailman's granddaughter. The only bad thing about Margot, and this was not her fault, was that she and her family lived next to one of the trashiest, nastiest families I had ever met that had two even nastier pit bulls. I'm talking nastier than doo doo that had been hoarded by dung beetles for years nasty. And these dogs were constantly escaping and terrorizing the neighborhood, even trying to get into her house. Margot had asked them more than once to please keep the dogs contained, especially since she had an elderly, fat cat named Mr. Bubbles and these pits had attacked smaller animals before. The family basically told her to rot in hell, that they knew what they were doing, how dare she accuse the breed, yada yada, basically blowing her off. Margot knew there had been reports filed against her neighbors but nothing had ever been done about it really. So she made sure to keep Mr. Bubbles in the house to keep him safe and was very careful not to let him out. If you had been paying attention up until this point, you'll notice I'm using the word was and had regarding old Mr. Bubbles. And it was as awful as you think. Three weeks before Christmas, Margot had the day off and was in the garage with Mr. Bubbles fiddling with some Christmas decorations. Unbeknownst to her, the pits next door got out and broke through the bottom of her garage door. They went right for Mr. Bubbles before she could blink and started to tear the cat apart. Margot screamed for help and it was only when her son and husband came out with a baseball bat that they were able to free Mr. Bubbles from the jaws of these dogs. I was working this day and will never forget when she came in, crying harder than I had ever seen anyone cry in my life, clutching poor dying Mr. Bubbles in her arms. Her husband had to hold her while we tried to bring Mr. Bubbles back but we couldn't do it, it would have taken a miracle of God and then some. He passed away. A truly crap way to go in what should have been the golden years of his fat, cat life. Margot sat there for a while with his mangled body, quietly crying for a while before she finally kissed whatever part of him was still intact and stood up. She told us all, I've got a job to do, take care of him, girls. And then left. We figured Margot would take a few days off to be with family and then continue on with life as normal. We figured wrong. Now when I say Margot knew everyone, I mean, everyone. Right after she left the hospital, Margot gathered herself up and went to the police with pictures of poor Mr. Bubbles and told her story. The same police officers she had watched grow up over the last 20 years from rowdy middle schoolers she used to help babysit to the officers they were today. They were absolutely shocked to hear what had happened to their surrogate grandma and pushed her case to the front of the line. The case found itself before a judge whose daughter had gone to school with Margot's daughter. The judge granted an emergency, dangerous animal extraction warrant to her neighbors. Of course, there was a hearing. Within two weeks which I gotta admit, was ridiculously fast. The neighbors tried to argue that their dogs weren't aggressive. They even went so far as to accuse Margot of having it out for their family and making it all up. But their argument trickled when the dozens of dangerous animal reports were presented and finally completely dried out when Margot presented the surveillance video her grandson had gotten showing the dogs coming into her property and attacking poor Mr. Bubbles. The emergency extraction and humane destruction of her neighbor's dogs was granted. It was Christmas Eve when Margot heard a knock on her door. She opened it up to see the neighbors standing there, sobbing uncontrollably. They were begging her to stop animal control that they had these dogs since they were puppies, 
how the kids would be devastated and it would ruin Christmas and if she could find it in her heart to give the dogs another chance. Up until this moment, the neighbors had behaved abominably. They didn't offer to fix the garage. They never apologized for trying to slander her name in court. Hell, they didn't even pay for Mr. Bubbles to be cremated. At no point, had they even shown the slightest shred of remorse for what damage their dogs had done. And as the neighbors stood there, blubbering and whimpering about how this was going to ruin their Christmas, Margot looked them straight in the eye and told them, in her calmest voice, You took away my family, so now I'm taking yours. And shut the door in their face just as animal control pulled up onto the driveway. Margot was not surprised as she watched the dogs get hauled into the truck and taken away. After all, it was her idea for animal control to take the dogs on Christmas Eve, a perk from having known the AC officer supervisor for years. Margot even made sure the dogs were euthanized before the outside Christmas lights turned on that night. The family never received the remains nor did they ever get a chance to bring another animal into their family as the father proceeded to drunk drive into a telephone pole that same night, killing him instantly. Mom went off the deep end so Child Protective Services picked up the kids by February. And ultimately, the house foreclosed in September. Despite how traumatic Mr. Bubbles's death was, I'd like to think that if the neighbors had shown at least some regret, Margot might not have gone as far as she did. She was and still is the person to forgive and forget. Or maybe, she ultimately knew it had to be done, to push it to this point of no return before another family lost a member to these irresponsible neighbors. Either way, thank you Margot for making the world a little bit safer for the pets in the world. And rest in peace, Mr. Bubbles. Hopefully I'll see you on the other side with your favorite orange sock and a can of tuna. To start, my younger sister and I were the recipients of this revenge. One year my sister and I were particularly brutal to each other. We even had to get put in separate rooms because we were fighting so much. On Christmas Day as any child would, my sister and I ran to the living room to see what presents we got from Santa. Only, there was nothing under the tree. We were confused and my mother asked if we had checked our stockings. When we went to check we saw coal in the stockings. My sister and I were confused so we ran to where we had left the cookies and milk and all we found was a note. The note said that he was very disappointed in us for our behavior and that we wouldn't be getting any presents this year because of how badly we acted. He even said we acted so badly that we would forever be on the naughty list. I started bawling my eyes out and my sister shut down. Then we heard the doorbell ring over my screams. When we opened the door, there was Santa. He said he changed his mind and that if we promised to behave from now on we could have our presents. We immediately agreed and he left. I wanted to peek out the window to see his reindeer and sleigh but my mother stopped me. After retelling the story one Christmas Eve that was when I learned everything. My mother had called the fire department because they did this thing on Christmas Day where they would dress as Santa and deliver presents to the needy. They didn't want to do it until my mother explained the situation and she would leave the presents outside. When she told this story to her co-workers they told her that what she did was terrible and that they would never do that to their kids. My mother would respond with, yeah well my kids behave now. It's been 15 years since the incident and my sister and I rarely fight to this day. I have vowed that if I ever have kids, I would do this to them if they are ever as bad as my sister and I were. This happened when I was 15. I'm a girl and me and my sister were living with our dad near the south coast in Australia at the time. That Christmas we spent with my dad's sister and her kids for the week before Christmas until New Year's. There's Jay and Ray, 17 and 13 years old. Me and my sister grew up around Jay and Ray and got along great with them so we were excited to spend Christmas with them. That, and our aunt lived on the beach so that made it even better. When we arrived we did the customary, hello great to see you how are you, I haven't seen you in forever yada yada introductions. It was a 3 hour car ride to get there in the south coast at Christmas time is hot as frick outside, so we were grateful to be out of the car and inside with the air conditioning. Ray left to go to his room and I thought nothing of it, until he came back, walked up behind me, tapped me on the shoulder and said, with an evil smile on his face, look what I got for Christmas. 
wrapped around his hand and shoulder was an impressively sized python. Ray stepped forward, holding his snake out to me and asked, you want to hold it? And by the look on his face I could tell that he was intending for me to be scared of the snake. But here's the thing, I grew up in the country and have avoided my share of brown snakes and red belly blacks, so needless to say, a baby python was nothing. I said, with a huge smile on my face, OMG that's awesome. Yes. Ray had the most disappointed look on his face as he handed his snake over for me to hold. That wasn't the first time he'd tried to scare me or pull a prank on me, and up until that point, I'd never retaliated. Tis the season to be petty. The next day we went into town and I bought what I needed to enact my revenge. Ray loved his reptiles, he owned bearded dragons and had owned other reptiles when he was younger, but he was deathly afraid of one reptile in particular. Frogs. I bought a motion-activated garden ornament that made a rivet noise every time you went past it. The next morning before anyone else was out of bed, I snuck into Ray's room to plant the frog. He's a heavy sleeper and I knew he'd be out until at least lunch time, so I had no concern about being caught. I wedged it in his cupboard in a place I knew would be hard to find. Well enough hidden that it couldn't be seen but open enough that the motion detector would still work. His cupboard was right next to his door, so the frog would go off every time he went to leave his bedroom. I set it in place, switched it on and went back to bed. At around 11 am I heard a loud squeal from Ray's room, followed by the sound of something being thrown against a wall. With the best concerned voice I could muster, I knocked on his door. I said, Ray, it's me. Are you okay? Can I come in? Ray, there's a damn frog in my room. I went in to investigate and offered to help to look for it. My aunt came in to ask what the matter was and chuckled to herself when we told her and she walked out of the room. She's not a bad mom, far from it. She'd come to offer her help eventually, after she had her morning coffee. I offered to help look for it, which inevitably meant I looked while Ray sat on his bed watching. Perfect. I subtly switched the motion sensor off while I looked for the frog. But of course, I couldn't find it. I left the room and waited for Ray to get into the shower before I snuck back into his room to switch it back on. Ray spent the rest of the day in the lounge room, refusing to go back into his room out of fear of the frog he heard again after he got back to his room. I waited until after dinner when I went back into his room, grabbed the frog and went back out into the lounge room. With an evil smile on my face and, with frog in hand, said, look what I got for Christmas. You wanna hold it? The look of shock on his face was priceless as he realized what I'd done. Merry Frogmas. When I went to university, me, my best friend and his girlfriend were all part of the philosophy society together. Basically a club where, once or twice a week, we would all meet up at campus and walk into town where we had reserved a room at a pub. There we would have terribly important discussions and solve all the world's problems over a pint of ale or a cider. We had some very good times in this society. Discussing thought experiments, philosophers, ethical dilemmas etc. And then the two of them broke up. Like any relationship, theirs had its ups and downs, but from the outside it had seemed to me all along like there was a little too much drama. Like a lot. And after they broke up, the drama only got worse. They were still in the same society, and the ex-girlfriend really, really was not able to just get along. I won't bore anyone with the endless flood of drama she was responsible for, but it all basically boiled down to two things. 1. She needed to be the center of attention whenever possible. She would claim credit for things she never did, present other people's ideas as her own, get upset if she wasn't invited to parties, etc. 2. She had a really bad tendency toward black and white thinking. Everyone was either her best friend or the demonic personification of treason and sent by Satan to torture her. All her exes were monsters. All her former friends had taken advantage of her or been mean to her. She was really good at making friends, just. She was also really good at losing them. I'm not a licensed psychologist, so I'm not going to say with confidence that she has histrionic personality disorder. But I am going to say that she regularly saw a psychiatrist and never told us more than that it was for her anxiety. 
While they were still together, she was exhausting to deal with, but after the breakup she turned into a diabolical ex-girlfriend. She hated my best friend. Somehow she was still cool with me, probably because I was pretty diplomatic and didn't call her out in public, just quietly corrected perceptions and fact-checked people when she wasn't around. Anyway, for a year or so after their breakup, they still both went to the philosophy society. Then my best friend graduated, and while he was still in the city, he mostly stopped going to this club. And when he stopped going, her lies got worse. When the three of us first met, she told us a few horror stories about the abusive men she had known before going to university, and my best friend and I were happy for her that she had managed to get past that and gotten to know good people like us. It's not hard to be better people than her exes, or so it seemed. But when my best friend stopped going, she started saying the same kind of crap about him she had said about her previous exes. She said that while they were together he had forced her to put up with things she didn't want sexually. She said she had done the breaking up, while we knew it was the other way around. That he had started stalking her after the breakup and groped her. Stuff like that. It was pretty clear to me that most of these were lies, because some of the incidents were stuff that had happened in real life and I had been present for, like destinations for trips or movies we had seen, etc., just with nasty lies added. And if she lied about some of them I was inclined to think she lied about the rest too, especially since my friend is one of the least violent people I've ever met, and all her lies were about him being violent or humiliating her, just like all her previous exes had supposedly done. After a few months of these lies, she said she had gotten a restraining order against him, and that that was why he hadn't come to our club anymore. This. Upset me. Obviously I disliked it all along that she had been lying about my friend, but he had asked me to keep my head down so she didn't turn on me too. This however was something else. She had lied about having to call the cops on him. And she had demonstrably lied about a restraining order. As I said, she still liked me, for some reason. She did most of her rumor mongering in private, with a few people at a time, so maybe she didn't think word would spread and was just looking for sympathy in the moment from the few people she lied to. But the whole club knew most of the stories she had told. So here I saw a golden opportunity. You see, I was social secretary or whatever it was called in the club. I was responsible for planning some of the events for the club. The main one being. The Christmas dinner. We decided on a restaurant for the dinner, and then I went there and set it up. Once the venue was booked, they needed to know the exact number of guests and everyone's order. So I collected names and orders and made a list and collected money from everyone who would attend. Except, I made two lists. One list I showed the club, and one list I showed the restaurant. The restaurant's list had one more name on it. My best friend's name. In the last few weeks before the Christmas dinner her lies got even worse. She started implying that the reason there was a restraining order in place was because my best friend had raped her. At this point, just about everyone in the club was very sympathetic toward her, and treated her like a hero for standing up to the bastard. With 90% of the members being undergraduates, people disappearing and being replaced by new faces all the time. Half the members had never even seen my best friend, but they sure knew he was a baddie, and wasn't allowed anywhere near the society. The day of the Christmas dinner came. My best friend and I were the first to arrive. One by one, the other members of the society arrived. Most had no idea who he was, and we just introduced him truthfully as a former president of the society. He got along great with some of the new faces and had a few conversations about philosophy and university life. And then his lying ex showed up. Or I should say, her new boyfriend showed up. She was outside. Someone had warned her the dangerous ex was inside, and that she should call the cops. Her boyfriend came in, made a scene and demanded that he get the hell out of there. Here's the thing. The new boyfriend genuinely believed her about the restraining order. So he gave us the perfect setup. After he shouted the restaurant went dead quiet, so my best friend was able to explain, calmly and in his normal speaking voice, that there was no restraining order and she had lied about that like she had lied about everything else. The new boyfriend thought we were lying, so he rushed back outside, ready to call our bluff. He urged her to call the police. 
But of course she couldn't do that. Because there was no restraining order and the police had never heard of or from either of them before, and the only one who had made a scene was the new boyfriend. My best friend was just quietly enjoying a dinner he had paid for and was trying to have conversations with the new members. After maybe 20 minutes the ex and her boyfriend came in. She told everyone who asked that she didn't call the police because she didn't want to ruin his life. Just about nobody believed that, fortunately. Me and my best friend had a great night. His ex, not so much. She left pretty quickly after eating. There was a lot of buzzing and people asking about what had really happened over the next week or so, and slowly but surely almost everyone realized that the woman had been lying her butt off about at least some of the stuff she was saying, and was probably lying about the rest too. Her new boyfriend stayed with her, and they are still together now, years later. I'm not sure what he believes at this point. It should be obvious that she lied, but he was always pretty heavily into the always believe the victim stuff, so maybe he just refuses to think about it. I don't want to end on a preachy note. We all know that sexual crimes are some of the worst things you can do, and lying about someone doing them is right down there on the bottom as well. I disliked the woman long before the Christmas dinner, but the fact that her lies escalated all the way until we were able to quash her in public, in front of most of her friends, and that they all learned the truth about what an awful person she was. That makes this probably my favorite memory from university. My best friend and I remain BFFs almost a decade later, and the Christmas dinner is something we still laugh about when we discuss it. I'm a regular at a bar. I don't have family, my roommate was out of town. So I went to the bar during Christmas. I was having a good night. Then this giant douche showed up. Now this douche and I don't have a lot of history in my mind. I was dating a girl three years ago. She cheated on me. I broke up with her. The whole relationship lasted all of a month. In my mind, that was the end of it. Shit happens, move on. The person she cheated on me with, was this douche. Now this douche is a weird person. I didn't harbor any ill will. This guy however, ran very vaguely in the same circles as me. He would see me at a bar or a party occasionally and make it a point to say, I sexy time that guy's girlfriend. Occasionally it was a party host saying, hey, that guy's worried about you fighting him, or at a bar someone told me, dude are you going to kick that guy's ass? Cause he's asking people to have his back. I had zero interest in this guy. I gave not a single frick about him. I just wanted to drink and have fun. What was weird about it is that he always introduced himself, and acted like he remembered me from somewhere. I would be like, yeah, you bang Jennifer. He would say, oh, how is she? To which I would reply, we stopped dating. You know, after you sexy timed her. He replied, oh, well good talk. And the smug prick would pat me on the shoulder. This was pretty annoying. I dated this girl for all of a month. It didn't even blip on my radar as a serious relationship. Except this guy would show up every now and then, and remind me he banged a girl I was dating. So I'm in this bar. I'm hanging out with some vets swapping war stories. And here comes this giant douche. He goes hey I know you from. I say, dude, not now, I'm in the middle of a story. Frick off for a bit. I finished my story and he came back and said I know you from somewhere, yeah, you sexy time Jennifer. I honestly don't give a frick. It was like three years ago. He left. The owner and the bartender were around me. The owner said, so do you hate that guy? I told him the story. He goes, are you going anywhere soon? After that question, frick no. The bartender was pissed because the douche was always grabbing her. The owner hated him because he was a drunk driving frickwit. At the bar, you don't drive drunk. The owner has a policy that if you need to get home, they'll pay for a cab if you pay it back the next time you're in. If you're stone broke, you get a cab home but you can just pay it back when you return. And he will call the police on your ass if you try to drive drunk. That dude doesn't tolerate that shit. This guy had a history of driving drunk from that bar. The bartender went back and made a phone call. And I drank a few beers. 
I was promised a show and I'd wait. The guy left and shook my hand. The smug prick even patted me on the shoulder and said, say hi to Jen. He pulled out and there were flashing lights. The bartender called the non-emergency line and said there was a repeat DUI offender at the bar and they sent a non-marked car to hang out in the parking lot. This is his charge as a third time offender. 120 days to 11 months, 29 days in jail, $1,100 to $10,000 mandatory fines. Add a license revocation for 6 to 10 years without restricted license available. Subject to vehicle seizure slash forfeiture, forced alcohol and drug treatment program and the judge could order an ignition interlock device installed at your expense. Merry Christmas to me. Royal AI wishes you a very hearthwarming Christmas. Let's hope next year will be a better year for all of us. Subscribe and hit the bell to start at the best way.